have your Bible with us this evening, open up to the book of Luke, chapter 23. Luke, chapter 23. Now, guys, this is an exciting chapter. We're into the last week. Let me just do a fast review here from last week. <clears throat> last week, we saw the crucifixion and the death of our Savior. Simon was chosen by God before he was born. I'll go as far as to say Simon was chosen by God before the foundation of the world that he would bear the cross of our Savior. Bear the cross of the Lamb of God. The Passover Lamb himself. Simon had come over 800 miles on a trip, maybe a once in a lifetime trip, to go to, to Passover in Jerusalem. While he's there, he's pressed into action to carry the cross of the Passover Lamb. Now we saw from church, not from church history, from the Bible, that it had an impact on his wife who became a believer, his two sons who became great Christian leaders. And so uh, I want to say to us that we should all bear the cross that Christ has given for us to bear. That's not something that I'm saying. Jesus said that we should bear our cross that he has given us. We saw the Savior's seven statements from the cross, even though Mark only mentions one of them. And then Luke only mentions three of them. We went ahead and looked at all, all seven of those statements. The first one Luke gives us, and he said it over and over and over and over again. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He said that over and over and over and over again. And Brother Mike asked a great question at the end of Bible study. Did God answer that prayer? Yes, he did. I believe with all of my heart that I don't know that all of them became saved. I certainly hope that we see these those men in heaven, those that spit on him, those that mistreated him, he certainly, Jesus prayed for them to be forgiven. There was never a prayer that Jesus prayed that God did not answer. When he prayed for this cup not to be removed from, to be removed from, he said, thy will be done. He, he knew what he was praying when he said, if not, then I'll at least say this, that when these men stand before God someday, they will not give an account for this. They may give an account for all the sins they've done in their life, but they will not give an account for this because Jesus has already, he's applying his blood at this time. He's dying for the sins of the world. And he said for this not to be laid to their charge. Then we looked at that center statement, number four. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The only one of the seven statements that's in two gospels, in Matthew and in Mark. It is not just the center, the, the, in the middle of the seven, it is the center of all human existence. Redemption was made during those darkness in three hours as he paid for our sins. He said it is finished. He faced all the horrors of hell. And you say, well, how can he do that? Well, because if we die and go to hell, we'll have to be there forever and forever and ever because sin demands an eternal punishment. But he not only is infinite in duration, we're infinite in duration, we'll last somewhere forever. He's also infinite in his nature. And he was able to pay for the sins of all the world in a finite amount of time. Then Luke tells us, he said, Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. He bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. All this was paid for. Now, we come to this part, the burial of Jesus Christ. This, if you take the gospel in short, you say, what does Paul call the gospel? Paul calls the gospel the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I know we talk about the seven fundamentals, but if you're just going to give the gospel in short, it still has the burial in there. Burial, as the Bible tells us, according to the scriptures, it's prophesied that he'd be buried, and he was buried. He was not thrown in some... Uh, uh, as, as, as other criminals would if families didn't come and take them he's not thrown into some garbage dump to be burned in Gehenna in fact he has a very beautiful and dignified burial and that's what we're going to see tonight one of the four I mean one of the seven fundamentals the fourth fundamental of the faith is what we are examining this evening so I'm going to read all of it verse 50 through verse 56 and then we'll go back and make comment about it and behold there was a man named Joseph a counselor all four gospels all four Gospels talk about Joseph of Arimathea. Each one tells us a little bit more of the picture of who he is. He's a counselor, which means he's part of the Sanhedrin court. He was a good man and a just. Why do you think about that? What a man. Now, wait, it'd be one thing if Brother Danny says, oh, I think Ray's a just and good man. It's another thing when the Word of God says. He was a just and a good man. God's Word says it. 
the same had not consented to the council and to need of them. Now, he, even though he was a member of the Sanhedrin, we'll, we'll see in another place that neither did Nicodemus. Nicodemus nor uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Yes, Mark tells us it was unanimous vote, so these two men must have already had their leanings a little bit open. Now, they, they wouldn't have been completely open because in John chapter 9, it said that anybody that would confess Jesus Christ, they put out of the synagogue forever. So imagine that would be like someone being saved out of out of uh, another religion today, being saved out of Catholicism, maybe into a, uh, a Protestant church and the family turns their back on them, or, or saved out of Buddhism or, or, or Islam, they turn their back on them. So he, these men are secret disciples, is what, what John calls them, uh, Nicodemus and Joseph. But he had not consented to the council or the deed of them. And he was of Arimathea, Luke's only one that tells us this, the city of the Jews, about 20 miles away, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. Wow. He was one of those, wasn't he? One of those fanatics, like, like Anna was when Jesus was born, or, or Simon. Remember when they said that, that Anna prop, uh, stayed and prophesied in the, in, 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 the, in the temple. She stayed there working with the prophets, I say. She stayed there ministering day and night, waiting for the coming of the Savior. And, and of course, when they came and brought the little late day old Jesus, Simon takes him up in his hands and says, I can die now. Can you imagine how scary this was to a new mom and dad? <laughs> I have seen the Savior. Hallelujah. He's one of them. He's one of those crazy people. He's one of us that believes the kingdom of God is coming. We're like that, aren't we? We believe the kingdom of God is coming. We really believe that. We believe it could happen tonight, that it could come and get us. We believe in a literal kingdom. So he's waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Now he will be known of Pilate. We'll find out in another place that he's filthy rich. In fact, history says he was, a, was the second richest man in all of Jerusalem. Uh, his buddy that was with them, Nicodemus, was either the third or the fourth richest man. So we're talking about some multi-millionaires, very powerful men. So he would have access. Politicians like Pilate always know who the rich folk are. But he goes there and he begs the body of Jesus. And what a weird thing that would be for him to do, Betty, to ask for this criminal's body. As far as in Pilate's mind, you know. So, And he took it down. I like Luke doesn't even really say the body so much here, does he? He took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone. Wow, that's expensive. I mean, that's some money there. I mean, you, that, that's something. Wherein never man before was laid. So it's a new sepulcher, one evidently he's preparing for himself or for his family, even though he's from Arimathea. He's looking for the kingdom, so he's going to be buried, stay in Jerusalem. So he'll be there when the, when the king comes, because the Jews certainly believe in the resurrection of the dead when the, when the Messiah came, when the king came. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. So this is Friday, the preparation, the Sabbath. And Sabbath was dry, drawing on. And the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher, how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices, anointments, and rested. I bet they didn't rest much, probably a very uneasy rest waiting for the sun to go down Saturday evening so they could start preparing the spices <laughs> rest of the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Okay, my God had a blessing to his words here. So we start out with Luke's account of the burial. John tells us that Nicodemus helped. These are two very rich men. They would not have wanted anybody else. In fact, all the Gospels say, seem to imply or either say like Luke does that he did it himself. So he and Nicodemus, I don't know if they have to get a little ladder. See, I know we see the crosses uh, raised up very high, but actually most of the time crosses were low. That was one of the bad things, that, like a, what, a thousand other bad things about being crucified. But the longest crucifixion on record took uh, 13 days for the man to die. And uh, the, they said the jackals and, and dogs ate his feet and feet off. And eventually, I guess he succumbed to all the blood loss and everything. The fastest crucifixion that they had without someone being assisted, like breaking their legs, was 16 hours. That's a fact. The Romans have this recorded, but they don't record the crucifixion of Jesus where he died in six hours. It was very unnatural, probably. Why? The, the, sun, the sun in the middle of the day turns dark. I mean, not just there, but all over the world. We know from all over the Mediterranean world because we have records. It was dark in Europe. It was dark in, in Africa. It was dark all 
Luke just says, hey, it covered the whole world. We just don't have records of it covering the whole world, but it did. So anyhow, they get they go to the body of Jesus and they take it down. They would be wearing their white Passover robes. Now, wait a second here. I'm looking at people that's actually done a day's work in their life a time or two, right? So you know what we're talking about here? Pulling nails out of that feet. They, they must have had some kind of piece of equipment, a crowbar or something like that. And they pulled the nails out of the feet. And I've I, I, I got a verse of scripture I want to read to you about the feet of Jesus from Isaiah chapter 52. How beautiful, Nahum says the same thing in Nahum chapter 1. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings and publish peace, that bringeth good tidings of good and publish salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Hallelujah. Well, I'm sure they thought of that verse as they take this out of his feet. These were Bible scholars. They were part of the Sanhedrin court. And uh, their white robes as they take, no doubt being careful not to be stabbed with the thorns, they take the crown off his head. I can, you know, a, a, a freshly dead body is not stiff, so when they got it out, the nails out of his hands, well, they just fell over top of their shoulders, right? So here they are covered with blood blood to pay for the sin of all the world. These are men that love, they can't be hidden anymore. He's went to the governor and said, can, he begged the body of Jesus. They can't be secret disciples anymore. It's out in the open. John, I mean Nicodemus and, and, and Joseph are both out in the open as wide open disciples. They're soon going to be uh, kicked out of this synagogue. They'll not be part of this anymore. Okay, let's see. Uh, I believe that God spoke to them. Of course, they just had a, they did have a few hours to get things prepared. So here's kind of what the plan is. John tells us they had 90 pounds, which would be in our language about 65 pounds of ointment. This is this is what rich people can do. <laughs> this is the burial for a king. This is not what poor people get. So they have the uh, this would this would be they would stuff they would already have at their homes because. When, some, when a Jew died, uh, they buried them within 24 hours, so you wouldn't have a time to go buy these sort of things. So, so they bring burial, probably what Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea would have, would have used on two or three family members. So they bring enough to anoint a king. 60, 90 pound weight, as it's called in the, in, in the Greek, but in our day and language, 65 pounds of ointment. That's a lot of ointment, isn't it? Very expensive. They would take a, a 14 foot linen cloth that was about three foot wide and you'd lay the body into it. Let's we'll, we'll, we'll slow down a little bit. They got the spices. They come. They are. They cannot take the Passover now. When, it, when, when the evening comes, they've touched the dead body. The tomb was either hastily bought or, as I think, it was actually for his family. But rich people can buy stuff on a fly too. But it, it was never been used. It makes it very clear. All the gospels make it had never been used. This was a new tomb. Just like he came into the world in a virgin womb, he goes out and, and, and uses a tomb for, for just a weekend, you might say, just for a, a tomb that no one else had ever used. And uh, Debbie and I have been there. And uh, we've been to the garden tomb, which is where many people believe is the, where Christ was laid, uh, it's a very spiritual experience, isn't it, Debbie, to go to the garden tomb. It's the only place where your Israeli guides will not lead you. That's where they would go in and you'll be turned over to evangelical, hardcore Christians, and they will talk to you about the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can go to the tomb. You'll certainly want to. You'll take communion while you're there. You'll worship the Lord while you're there. Sing songs. Praise the Lord. Then we went to the Holy Sepulcher, which is the other site where people say was the resurrection tomb. And I've read so much material on both of them. Before we went, and I don't know how much since we've gotten back, there's good archaeological arguments for both of them. All I know is this. Here's the important part. Are you ready to pass it? Both of them was empty. That's all that mattered to me was it might not even be either one of them. But I guarantee you wherever it's at, Jesus' body ain't there. It's an empty tomb. Hallelujah. Oh, right, so they, that, that's a tomb that rich people can have. And uh, he did not die as a martyr. He did not die as an example. He died as a sacrifice. He laid in the tomb according to the scripture. 
to fulfill the word of God as the Messiah. And he rose victorious over death. Hallelujah. Imagine these men as they take the nails out of his hands, as they look at that side. Not one of his bones was broken, fulfilling the prophecy of the word of God. But a soldier then took a spear and shoved up into his side, ruptured the heart, and out came blood and water, which tells you what trauma he had already suffered. I talked to Shelley about this years ago, and she was explaining to me, I didn't understand half of what she was saying, but she was explaining to me what this was like, you know, how you, your blood separates with uh, serious trauma and this and this, and that sometimes it can be healed, you know, it can be healed, but of course they just shoved a spear in there. And out came the blood and water, the Word of God tells us. We still sing about it today, don't we? From the wounded side. These men washed him with water. That's, that's the deal. They would wash him ceremonially. Same deal that Jewish men are treated with today. Same respect. They respected him as you would a family member. He was their savior. They washed his body. They cleaned it. They dripped the, the, the proper ointments. In fact, more than way more than be needed. What would be for a king? They would bring the, the that down. They would take a, uh, John mentioned this, the, the napkin the, that they would tie around his jaw to hold his jaw together. Then they would go over this. They would tie his knees together after they put the cloth down in his ankles and his hands and they cross and go around it. And they, they did it all. These men t did all of that, you know. And so uh, they did it because they loved, loved him. They loved him. They, 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 he had paid for our sins, you know. So uh, then we see the ladies, though. They're... They watch this, so they know that he's been in, not embalmed. He's been anointed properly. So they are preparing other ointments and spices. Verse fifty-six, uh, doing what they can. They can't. They will not unwrap the body of Jesus. That's not their plan at all. No one would do that. That would be cruel and gross. But they're bringing other fragrances to put on him, uh, as as women could, as 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 common everyday workers could, I should say. But it's not the men that go to the tomb. No, 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 no. It's the women that go to the tomb. And they go there to, uh, to put spices on the body of Jesus. Uh, here's what's funny. It never mentions what happens to the spices. Did they just drop them? When, when you see angels, strange things start happening. They take these spices there, and then all of a sudden the angel says, What are you doing? You're in here. You know, we don't read any more about the spices on them. Somebody said, Let's gather this back up. It's very expensive, or what they did. But anyhow. So that is Luke's account of the burial. Now I want to go to Mark's account, and then we'll, uh, at the end, be taking notes if you if for questions or comments that you'd like to ask. But that's Luke's account of, of the burial of Jesus Christ. So let's go to Mark now. Mark chapter 15, verse 42. And we're going to see some of the same things again, but we're also going to see some other things that he talks about. Mark chapter 15, verse 42. And now when the eve was come, because it was the preparation, by the way, that Greek word there, you know how some people try to say Jesus was, was crucified on Tuesday or maybe Jesus was crucified on Wednesday. or just, Actually, that Greek word there is the Greek word that they use today for Friday. <laughs> the word preparation here. So it's, it's that Greek word. Now you can say, well, maybe it's because of Christian church. They just took that word and it eventually became Friday. Maybe, I don't know. I'm just saying that's one more. I don't need any proof that he died on Friday. When it tells me he rose on Sunday, I, I know. He didn't say he was going to raise after three days. He said he was going to raise during his third, third day, okay, on the third day, on it day, no, after that day. Now when the eve was come, because it was a preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, tells you again that's Friday, Joseph of Arimathea, listen to this, an honorable counselor, who waited for the kingdom of God. Wow. Th those are words you could preach on a long time. Those are good characteristics for everybody to have. Every Christian should have those. We should be honorable. We should be able to counsel people in the word. We should be waiting for the kingdom of God. And Mark is translated a little different. It's the same word. Came and went in boldly. Boldly. He went in with some authority. He uh, is excited. He he wants to make sure this gets done. He's going to put the full weight of his, of his fortune behind this. He goes in boldly unto Pilate and craved, it's the same word, begged, the body of Jesus. 
Do you get the picture he wanted Jesus' body? If you read his account in Matthew, if you read his account in John, you're going to see the same thing. Joseph, this wealthy man, wanted the body of Jesus. I don't know. If, you, if you're in the garden tomb, you can look and see Golgotha. You can look and see Calvary. They may have even been waiting in the tomb. I don't know. If you go to the Holy Sepulchre and the place of crucifixion, you can, both places the tomb is close enough to where you can see the crucifixion area, whether, whichever one that you choose to believe is correct. So these men may have been waiting. I wonder what it was like when they saw the darkness come. The darkness covered the whole world. Nobody had torches. Nobody was ready for darkness in, in the middle of the day, from 12 o'clock in the day to 3 o'clock in the day. We'd be expecting something crazy like that. And, uh, and I wonder, these are two very rich men, and they knew the scripture. I wonder if they said, you know Nicodemus? What's that, Joe? You know where Isaiah said that he'd be making his death and with the criminals but also with the rich? You think that's us, Joe? You think that's us, Nick, you know? I mean, these men knew the Word of God. These were not Bible students. These were Bible scholars. In fact, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you are the teacher of Israel. The teacher of Israel. The top teacher, the number one teacher in Israel. In fact, it says when Nicodemus lost his fortune, which he certainly does, and this is in church history, not in the Bible, that he becomes, uh, because his student, Gamaliel, who was also a very famous teacher, we read in the book of Acts, Gamaliel is the one in Acts chapter 5 that says, be careful about what you're doing to these Christians. If they're of God, you're going to be found fighting against God. If they're not of God, it'll fizzle out in a little while. But anyhow, it's said that he moved into his home. Uh, there are some records of that later, but again, that's, that's church history. And, uh, and Joseph of Arimathea started the very first church in England. Philip, the, uh, the deacon, the church leader, sent him to England to start a church. That, that's church history. But anyhow, so uh, you might find this interesting. Nicodemus was the teacher of Israel. And Joseph has already been called by Luke and Mark a counselor. In all of Jewish history, there are only 14 counselors. 14 counselors. So these are, these are like super Bible scholars, what I'm trying to get across to you. These are the men. They know the word of God, and they've accepted the Messiah. Let's read Luke's account now without stopping. Now, let me just keep going. Crave the body of Jesus, verse 44. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, who must have actually went with this rich man, uh, or either sent all the way back to Golgotha to find out, I don't know. And he asked him whether he had been any while dead, and when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph gave the body. That word's only used three times in the entire Bible. It means give as a gift. The other two times it's used is used by Peter as he's writing to the church talking about the power of God and the gifts of God. So Luke chooses, he could have chose five other words, maybe ten, I don't know how many other Greek words there are for gave or, or, to, or to give or something like that, but he chooses this particular Greek word under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, this word that is to give as a gift. So he gave this buying some political favor from Joseph, I hope. He helps. And, and, and he, bought, he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen, laid him in the sepulcher, which was shewn out of a rock, which tells you how expensive rolled a stone into the door of the sepulcher. So evidently he and Nicodemus would do this. It would take about five strong men or about eight men to roll a stone back away from the sepulcher. Roll it down would usually take two or three men. So he may they may have had uh, the centurion with them at this time or something. Maybe Pilate made him go with. But they it would take two men, good strong men or three men to let the stone back over. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. So they know exactly where he is. So let me make a little comment about this now. Had they searched the scripture to know that the Lamb of God would die this day, or this week, I should say, Dr. Warren Wiersbe thinks so, and I know several of y'all use Dr. Wiersbe's commentary. He thinks that they actually were preparing already earlier in the week. I don't, I don't know. I certainly think that God spoke to them, and they did get prepared. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, let me read this to you uh, about this. Isaiah's account of the crucifixion before it ever happens. Isaiah 53, verse 3. 
He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, that's your peace, my peace, was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. And who shall declare to his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. So uh, Isaiah saw it beforehand. David saw it beforehand. Uh, many of the prophets and, and writers of the Old Testament saw it beforehand. So these men are fulfilling Scripture. They bury in him. Uh, a couple last things about these men. Uh, imagine the honor that Jesus may have given them or must have given them after the resurrection. We know that Jesus met with over 500, Paul says, over 500 disciples at one time. I'm sure among that group were these two men because they are dedicated to Jesus. I wonder what it was like to look in those eyes that they had closed in death. <laughs> to see life there again. Are you getting this? Jesus really was a dead body. A dead body. And he really is alive. <laughs> That's our whole... If there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. We are, we are a resurrection religion. All we have... We are the religion that believes in resurrection. Now I understand that Jewish people believe in resurrection uh, from the dead for the great kingdom. Okay, I understand that. And, 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 and they are certainly were true to, to God until the New Testament when they rejected the Messiah, even though there's many thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of Jews that believe in <coughs> Jesus Christ today right now and many thousands more in the past years. But uh, can you imagine as they, they stood there after the resurrection and they see his eyes? I just kind of imagine stuff, you know. Did he smile at them? Did he say something to them? Man, my disciples fled away, but you stayed. <laughs> you buried me. You fulfilled the scripture. You did what God wanted to do. Uh, they all, as I said, they lost their wealth as, because they, they knew they would because they were in the council in John chapter 9 when they agreed, uh, when the council as a whole, not those two in particular, then anybody that was a believer would be removed from the council. All right. So, that is the burial account from these two Gospels. It doesn't get near as much attention as the other fundamentals does. Books are written about the virgin birth, the sinless life, the death of Calvary, his resurrection, his ascension. It doesn't get a lot of attention either. The return of Jesus Christ gets millions of pages a year written about and preached about, you know. But this is the fundamental. If you, if you don't have this, if Jesus Christ was not buried, then we have no proof that he raised. If he was buried in a tomb that had other bodies, we have no proof, you know. But he was buried in a tomb, and when he left, there was still no smell of death because he was so heavily anointed. There was only the smell of life. Jesus Christ is alive. Hallelujah. All right, so let's go on to the resurrection now. Of course, we won't cover this to the last chapter of Mark. Now, we'll get started in the last chapter of Mark, but we won't cover it this evening. And when the Sabbath was passed, so now it's Sunday, the first day of the week. We call it Sunday. They just call it the first day of the week. Everything's measured from the Sabbath day. So everything's measured from there. Okay. And when the Sabbath was passed, and it's passed in so many ways because we don't keep a Sabbath anymore, do we? I know that upsets some people. It upsets some people in our church that we don't keep a Sabbath, but we don't keep a Sabbath. Uh, we, uh, we meet on the first day of the week. We meet for new creation. We don't celebrate creation. We celebrate the new creation, being born again. We meet on the first day of the week and celebrate creation. I mean, celebrate recreation. So, so, and plus, Paul says that Jesus is our Sabbath. So we don't keep a Sabbath. We have a Sabbath. We know a Sabbath. We've been bought by a Sabbath. Sabbath was passed. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, had, had, had bought sweet spices, had, had brought, uh, no, bought sweet spices, that they might come and anoint him. They're going to do what they can. They're going to do what they can. They 
they can't. Uh, it's too late now for the, all the cleaning, the washing, the all the all the things to happen. But they're going to do what they can before they go because they'll have to go back to Galilee. They're they're who they thought would be the Savior's dead. They've got to go back and grind corn and build houses and do whatever it is they do, you know. So they're going to leave Jerusalem. So they come to anoint the body. They didn't even think anything about Jesus being raised from the dead, did they? They, they had no fig, figure that he might be raised from the dead. They bought these spices to put on him. And very early in the morning, I heard a bad joke the other day. said, Jesus was an early riser. You should be too. So, uh, but anyhow, so very early in the morning, the first day of the week, because that's how they would de everything's determined from the Sabbath, they came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. At the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? So they knew that a handful of women, seven, eight, ten women could not roll back. Because they'd seen it. They saw if this was a, the stone of a rich man. This was a large stone. And so... They, they, they are thinking about how can this be, you know, how we're going to get into this. Again, no thought of the resurrection. Now, let me just take a little time out here. I know we're not studying Matthew, but I need to point this out this, right now. If they had known what Matthew writes years later, of course, Matthew didn't know it at the time. He's with the other apostles, care, uh, staying in fear, you know. But Matthew writes years later that during the Sabbath, when they should have been celebrating the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders would go to Pilate, and they begged Pilate to put a guard in front of the tomb, remember? And actually to put a Roman seal on the tomb. And so he gives them a watch or a, uh, a uh, I forget the other word, but it's, it means 16. They gives, it gives them soldiers. Some people say 24. But 24, you can say whichever one you want. 24 or 16 soldiers. If they had known the Roman soldiers were there, they would have never left their houses. They had not going to let them near that tomb. Roman soldiers hate Jews. They're not going to let them near that tomb. But they don't know that, do they? This has been kept from them. They, you know, uh, None of the apostles would know this at this time. This was the, the uh, Sanhedrin and went there and uh, commissioned Pilate to do this. So none of them would know this. So they go. By the way, I want to tell you something. And when they looked, verse 4, they saw, they looked actually, the Greek words, they looked up, so they're coming up toward the garden, or the tomb, whichever tomb that is. They're coming up toward the tomb. They look up, they saw the stone was rolled away, and they could see it from a distance even though it was early in the morning because it was very great. It was a big stone. It was a rich man's stone. And uh, just before they got there, there was this angel named George. No, I don't know what his name is. There was this angel. We don't even know his name. And God sent him from heaven, and he rolls the stone away. In fact, the Bible says he flings it away and then makes a chair out of it and goes sits on it. Because he can, because he's an angel. He's, all those Roman soldiers lay on the ground shaking, pretending to try to be, they want to pretend they're dead, but they can't quit shaking and pretend they're dead. And uh, they don't leave till he leaves, and then they, they're gone by the time the ladies get there. So this all happens very quickly, within just a few minutes. And they're gone, but now they see, and they're very brave, and entering into the sepulchers, because like, they really love Jesus. They saw a young man. Not terrifying to them, was it? I don't know if it's the same angel or not, but they don't see him as terrifying. Sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, they were frightened. Now, they were still afraid, you know. He said to them, and it's a command. It's not a request, by the way. I think this is very weird. Some things in the Bible just really kind of throw me for a loop. And this is one of them. He commands them, stop being afraid. I mean, it's hard to look. It's hard to stop being afraid, okay? Just like it's hard to stop laughing sometimes. I mean, you know, you can tell people, stop laughing, it just makes them laugh more. You tell people, don't be afraid. Okay. And I see the gorilla standing there, but I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to be so brave, you know. No, but he does. This is really a weird thing in the Bible. He says, stop being afraid. You're not allowed to be afraid. But then he tells them why, and now it starts making sense. Why should you not be afraid? You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He was crucified. <laughs> now he's risen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> he was, I underlined that in my Bible, he was crucified, and I put this in parentheses, and he is risen. He's gone. He's not here anymore. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. 
Two good men laid him in a particular place, but he's not there now. He's risen from the dead. Quit being afraid. I'm sure God doesn't want us to be afraid, does he? But sometimes I am anyhow, and I know God doesn't want me to be afraid. But sometimes you get scary news. Sometimes the scary news is about you or whatever. I mean, so sometimes it's hard not to be afraid. Or may not even involve health at all, but sometimes maybe you see something in society that you say, I can't help this out. It's beyond, well, quit being afraid because Jesus is alive. It's not up to you. <coughs> it's, not, it's not up to you. Jesus is alive. But go your way, and I don't know what that way that is for you. I know what sort of what the way is for me. I know kind of what he wants me to do. He, uh, he's, he's called me to be a teacher of the church and and to help provide some leadership. Sometimes still on days of the week, I don't know exactly what he wants me to do that day. That's why we've got to pray all the time, right? we always got to pray. Just keep praying. Go our way. Be doing what he wants us to do. And tell his disciples, and what's the next two words? And Peter. And Peter. <laughs> now, how's Peter going to feel when he hears this? Okay. <laughs> He's not there, there to hear the inflection in the angel's voice. Does he say, go and tell his disciples, and Peter, encourage him, okay? Or does he say, go and tell his disciples, uh, an old cock crew rolling Peter, you know, you know. So, I mean, he don't know. That's why. I know y'all all love this, but I don't. When people send me texts and stuff, I don't know. I can't hear the inflection in your voice. I tell people, there was a reason that the telegraph was done away with when they invented the telephone. But now, everybody's got these, and they want to send me texts, or they want to send emails. And Sometimes I can't tell what you're talking about. Not you in particular, okay? But pick up the phone and call. I can hear your voice. It's more soothing. I can tell whether you're distressed or not distressed. Even better if you could, of course, see people face-to-face. -face. But the telephone's pretty good. You can hear people's think, uh, what their voice and their tone and stuff. But So, Peter, I wonder what he's thinking. What would you think? women get back and say he said to come and tell his, his disciples and Peter Peter says uh oh <laughs> wow I really messed up bad didn't I now we know that he's wanting Peter to be encouraged okay but Peter doesn't know that yet he denied him three times he denied him three times and Jesus soon asked him three times to feed his sheep so each, each denial gets a gets a confession you know so uh so he's going to, he's restoring Peter. Peter's going to be the leader of the church. That's why he said it that way, because he wanted Peter to know that he, wanted, he was. I think so, right. Yeah. But now, if I'm Peter hearing this, I didn't hear what the angel said, okay? And and I'm saying, well, no, say, say this again now, ladies. Y'all Say it again. Y'all's getting ready to leave, and the angel says, go tell my disciples. Now, how did he say, and Peter? You know. <laughs> How did he say it? What did he look like? I know he's scary. He's an angel, but what did he look like? So, but it's all going to pass. I mean, but it's still, at that he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall you see him. Now, that's another verse. As he said unto you, now that's another verse that's confusing to me, okay? Now, so I wrote this now. That this verse confuses me. He says, in all the Gospels, go tell him to go to Galilee, and I'll meet with you there. But then, what's he doing? He meets with them in Jerusalem. I know he's going to have the long 40-day meeting with them in, 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 uh, in Galilee. Most of the time, they'll come back to Jerusalem evidently briefly before he goes up into heaven, I think. It's what it seems to be. It's always hard to get locations nailed out exactly where everything's happening. But we do know they're still in Jerusalem, and he appears to Peter this day. So that's going to help Peter out before the day's over. Jesus is going to have a personal talk with Peter. That's going to feel good. At some point, he's going to appear to his brother James, who's not a believer yet, but he's going to become a believer, and all of his brothers become, and sisters become believers. He's going to appear to Mary Magdalene before the day is over. He's going to appear to the 11. Now, I, know, I don't think it's all 11 of them. It's just the term, the 11, like they used to be called the 12, because we know that Thomas is not with them that evening, unless, unless Mark's talking about something that happened eight days later. But anyhow, so... I, I, really, I do understand this, that most of this takes place in Galilee when Jesus does his great teaching to them and, and gets them prepared to build the church. To he, They touch him, they feel him, they eat with him. Uh, he's alive, he's, a, he's alive. He is alive. And so he, he's teaching them again and giving them hope again and all these sort of things. But uh, so uh, 
All right, so let's, let's keep going here. He meets with them in Galilee, but for, first I want to point out that he does a lot of meeting we have recorded for us in Jerusalem before they get out of town. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything any man, for they were afraid. Now, according to some Bibles, that's where the Gospel of Mark ends. Guys, that's a bad way in the book, ain't it? Does that sound like a gospel to you? The last words, they are afraid. Yay, that's a good story. That's a gospel story. That's silly. We'll talk about this next week, the Lord's willing. Verse 9 through verse 20 should be in your Bible. If you have a Bible that doesn't have it in it, then you don't have a good Bible. You need to get you a Bible that has verse 9 through verse 20 in it because it's God's Word. There's nothing, nothing that implies this is not God's Word. And we'll talk some about this, the Lord's willing, next week, but I don't want to get caught up in that right now. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. Now, we don't, we don't read about it here. We read about it in John, how it happened. And you remember, she's outside the tomb. Peter and John's, she's already been to the tomb. She goes back, gets Peter and John. Peter and John runs to the tomb. She gets there after Peter and John. They, they look in the tomb. Peter goes in the tomb. They leave. Mary's still standing, even though the angels have told her, the angels have told her that, that it's risen. Uh, she's still standing outside crying, and uh, somebody speaks to her, and uh, she thinks it's the gardener. You remember the story, don't you? And then all of a sudden he calls her by name, Miriam, and she says, My Lord, huh? Rabboni, my, my master, my savior, my Lord. All right, and, and I, I made a little note for myself because I want to ask y'all a question. Maybe, I, maybe I'm missing this, and I didn't do research on this. So I'm just asking y'all. Mary was personally affected by Jesus. She had seven demons in her, and Jesus cast the demons out of her. In fact, she's only mentioned in one little short verse in Luke, and then she's mentioned in all the Gospels at the end, okay? Okay, so, uh, but were there any of the 11 apostles that Jesus touched their bodies? I know he did a miracle for Peter's mother-in-law. Now, you guys read the Bible. I can't think of any. I, I I can't think of any. Otis, can you think of any? No. If you do, or if anybody listening knows of any, just send me a text. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Call if you can. Okay, but uh, but uh, I'd like to know because Mary seems to be so passionate about her love for Jesus. Now, she wasn't expecting a resurrection or anything, but she does seem weirdly passionate. And I guess if you had seven demons in you, I mean, what, what kind of horror would that be in your life to have demons inside of you and you, your own personality is suppressed by I'm not talking about multiple personality I'm talking about demons that got demons that fill her and uh, and Jesus set her free hallelujah I know he cast demons out of thousands he said they just kept bringing in one place in Mark he said they kept bringing and they kept laying them down and they laid them down he picked them up and he cast the demons out he cast the demons out he cast the demons out he healed the lepers he did the, just miracle after miracle after miracle he does but she loves him so he meets with her, and when she went and told them that what had, that 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 had been with him, as they mourned and wept. And okay, she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they that had and they that had heard and they had heard he had, was alive, and had, and been seen of her believed not, even after they had an eyewitness testimony. From a pretty good source. I mean, they knew Mary. She wasn't a liar. They knew Mary. And I knew women. I know women in those days couldn't give couldn't give testimony in court, even though Jewish women were very highly respected. They weren't treated like Roman women or other women of the day. They still couldn't give testimony in court. But still, she tells him, I talked to him. I touched him. And then the other women get back, and they after he meets with Mary, he meets with the other women, and they t they still don't believe. After that, he appeared in another form, so they wouldn't, he wouldn't be recognized at first, under two of them as they walk and went out into the country, into Emmaus. We'll, we're not going to look at that this evening, but that's actually... Mark tells us these accounts, but he don't actually tell us... He don't give us any words of Jesus, or he just says it happened, okay? And they went and told it unto the residue, the, the others. Neither believe they them. They don't believe anybody. They don't believe Jesus got up from being dead. Now let's go to Luke and see Luke's account of this very first thing happening here, okay? Then we'll take another week or two. This, this by the way, is our 39th study. I thought it takes us about 45 studies to go through these two books, and 
but we'll finish next week will be 40 or 41 the lord's willing we'll, and so uh but i think we went appropriately uh at an appropriate speed uh slow enough to, to get the basic meanings of, of, of luke and, and mark so let's go back to luke to look at the resurrection account chapter 24 the last chapter of luke now the last chapter of luke the the authenticity of the resurrection that's our hope i want to say it again we are a resurrection religion let me say it again for anybody listening we are a resurrection religion we believe in the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead he was the first fruits. As a matter of fact, you know something exciting? At about 6 a.m. when the sun comes up, the first day after the after the, the first day after the first Sabbath, so it'd be Monday is what we'd say. I mean, it'd be Sunday is what we'd say. So the first day, which would always be a Sunday, first day after the first Sabbath after the Passover. So that's today. We're reading about is when the feast of. Uh, first fruit starts, and then 50 days later, they'll have the Feast of pa uh, Pentecost, which we know about that in the book of Acts, right? So we know what happens 50 days later. But right now, as Jesus is, as the guards are running away, and Jesus is getting out of the grave, not, he didn't have to have the stone moved away. You remember, he could go, the stone was rolled away so that Calvary Baptist and Jaeger could look into it. But we can read about it tonight, okay? So, but there's a priest that's got all the sheaves. He's waving it back and forth. Got it in his arms, just like it was described in the book of Leviticus. We read, studied just a couple of years ago. He's waving back and forth. It's the wave offering. He's waving back and forth in front of a curtain that's been torn, <laughs> recently torn on Friday. This is Sunday morning. He's, he's going back and forth with the first fruits. And the first fruits are who? Jesus Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul says. It don't slip Paul's mind that he raised on first fruit day. He died on Passover. Raised on first fruit day. He started the church on Pentecost. Are you starting to see that maybe these Jewish feasts are important in the calendar of our Lord? They are, by the way. Maybe someday we'll really dig into those or you can maybe get a study by uh, John Hagee where he goes over the Jewish feast and the relationship of the body of Jesus Christ. It's, it's a good study. It's worth ordering and uh, or, or listening to it if you can listen to it. But you, I know you can order it. It's a small price for it. So anyhow, but uh, so he raises it's first fruits day, and Paul talks about this how that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. Why? So that we can all be raised from the dead. He is victorious over death. <sighs> death, hell, and the grave have no power over Jesus, and now death, hell, and the grave have no power over you. They have no power over us. Hallelujah. <laughs> all right. So now, uh, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning. They came, the, the women, we just read about in verse 55, verse 56, this group of women that had arrested and they got these spices. Now upon the first day of the week, Sunday, the new creation, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. So there's even a larger group, not, not besides the one that Luke mentions in verse 55, verse 56. Now, I'm going to get, this is where Sister Joyce uh, Morgan used to help me out here. Because this is a little bit confusing to me, okay? The commentaries and the Greek commentaries point out this is a disjunctive conjunction. That don't mean a thing to me. I was a math guy. I'm not an English guy. So I looked it up again since I mean nobody would be here to help me with I'm, I mean to tell y'all short. Maybe. Do y'all know what disjunctive conjunctions are? Sister Joyce would just rattle it right off, okay? She knew all that stuff, okay? But listen. It's when you link two things together that have already been read, yet knowing that we're entering into a different linked topic. But that's not all. All conjunctions sort of do that. But the point is that only one can be true, okay? There are disjunctive conjunctions. Either Jesus rose from the dead or Christianity is a lie. Either Jesus got up from being dead or we're all going to die and that's it. No. You've got to make your mind up. Did Jesus raise from the dead? Is Jesus alive? You can't just say, I don't want to make my mind up. You have to make your mind up. Both cannot be true. Either he raised from the dead or he's a liar. He said he was going to raise from the dead, and I believe that he raised from the dead. Okay, Jesus is not just a prophet. No, he is the resurrected Messiah. There is not a Christianity without a risen Christ. Okay. They... And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. Though they didn't expect it. They did not expect to see the stone rolled away. 
Now, so they found something they didn't expect, and then they don't find something they do expect. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. So it's kind of weird. I like how Luke writes. I, I, Luke, I, I've told you many times, is my favorite gospel. I just like how he writes stuff. So he says, they found the stone, rode away. They weren't expecting that. They go in. They found not the body of Jesus. So this is blowing their minds. They, they found something they shouldn't find, and they didn't find something they were expecting to find. And it came to pass while they were much perplexed, Say, Luke is cool, isn't he? He just puts it right out there. He don't say, oh, these were great Christian women and they had no fear in their... No, Luke just throws it out there. They were... They didn't know what's going on. Behold, two men, and Mark tells us about one of them, stood by them in shining garments. The word that Luke uses here, shiny, doesn't mean shiny. Wait, look, look at me now, listen now. Big difference here. Shiny is one thing. The, Luke doesn't say they're shiny. He says they're shining it's a, it's a Greek word that was used when Jesus was transfigured before the apostles when his glory was shining out. These two angels are powerful angels. These are the kind of angels you read about in the book of Genesis. These are the kind of angels you read about in the book of, uh, of Revelation. These are shining angels. And, and so as you look at them, it's like lightning just come flying out of them. And then lightning comes flying out. Then lightning comes flying out. No thunder. Just lightning is shining and shining and shining and shining. And they were afraid. I guess they were. They bowed their faces to the earth. They fell right on their faces. And they said unto them, these two, now Mark tells us, they, they say, quit being afraid. Straighten up, girls. Quit being afraid. But that's not all they said. They asked a question. Quit being afraid. Why seek ye the living among the dead? Huh. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? Are you something wrong with you, you ladies? Why are you looking for dead people, uh, living people among dead people? In fact, here's the interesting to me. Now. The word living is singular. The word dead is plural. Literally what it says is, why are you looking for the living one among the dead ones? <laughs> He's the living one. Why would you be looking? Ladies, I'm sorry. Why are you looking for him among the dead ones? Quit being afraid. I done told you. Quit being afraid. Quit that shaking. Okay. And so these angels are scary, aren't they? They're very scary. They're shining. Uh, the, I, I know Mark, uh, Mark says, well, they look like young men. He only talks about one of them. So, you know, they're trying. They're not trying to scare the ladies, but they're scared anyhow. Uh, weird things are happening. Uh, an earthquake happens on their walk there. Uh, uh, they, they, the stone is rolled away. The body of Jesus is missing. They see these two angels. Mark just talks about one of them. And the, and the angel said, quit being afraid. And by the way, ladies, why are you looking for the living one among the dead ones? And here's what happens. And as they were afraid, and bowed their, down their faces to the earth, they said, it, he, they said, the angel said to them, why, seek, why are you looking for the living one among the dead ones? He is not here, but he's risen. Remember, remember, do you remember? How he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee? So the angels knew this. The angels knew this. The angels were always around Jesus' ministry, weren't they? They were there when he was born. They were there when he was tempted in the, in the wilderness. And evidently the angels traveled with him unseen because they heard this. Ladies, do y'all not remember? We remember. Of course, I guess you do. Your angels, you've got good minds. Okay. Say, the angels knew this, the Son of Man, is, they're quoting Jesus, now must be delivered in the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day, raise again, rise again. Ah, oh, I love this. Are you ready for verse 8? And they remembered his words. See, it's all about the Word of God. It's all about the Word of God. And I commend you for being in Bible study this evening. I commend you for listening to this this evening or some other, other time. I commend you for that because, see, so many people, here's here's what I hear a lot of. People know I'm a pastor, so and now I'm a pastor. I'm a principal school that takes in almost all of Mingo County, uh, the Tug Valley area, everything except the Tug Valley area. And people come to me and say, Oh, Principal Dean, I got a word from God last night. I said, Wow, what were you reading? <laughs> no, I saw a crow fly across Mom's grave and dropped an acre right behind it. And then I saw, I saw a, a bird come down another day, and there was frost right outside my window this morning. And I'm thinking, get the Bible. Read the Bible. Get your Bible. Get your Bible. 
I'm not saying that God may not speak. It's, but it, it, you know how He speaks? He speaks through His revealed Word. He revealed Himself. God could have revealed Himself anyway, but He chose to reveal Himself with words. The anointed men of God, they wrote down the Word of God, and that's how we got the Bible. Now, it, I'm, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Look, if it makes you feel good, just watch creation. Creation ought to make you feel good. Watch the crows. Watch the robins. Watch, watch the snakes. Watch everything, man. There ain't nothing wrong with that. But God may speak to you through creation, but I remember what it says in the book of Romans chapter 3. God spoke to people through creation, but now He speaks to us through His Word. So there is a certain amount. You, there's nobody in the world that can say there's not a God because you can see a tree and know there's God. That didn't happen by accident. But you can't know that God without the Bible. You have to, to know that God. Somebody's got to tell you about the Bible. Somebody's got to tell you about Jesus Christ. The reveal, God revealed himself. So he, they say, remember the word, lady. Just remember the word. Please just remember the word. Go with the word. They remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the mother, and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women were with, with them, which told these things unto the apostles. Now, this is before he's appeared to them yet, okay? And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Hmm. Huh. Their words. Well, you know, that's one of the best proofs that the Bible is true. Because if you were writing a false gospel, you would never let women be the first to testify about it. And if you did, you'd make the apostles heroes, wouldn't you? The apostles heard and they were great men of God. They stood. No, they were cowards. They didn't believe a thing. They had eyewitnesses. They still wouldn't believe it. They wouldn't believe it. They wouldn't believe it. Even when the two gets back from a mess, which we'll look at next week. We already read them, Mark, the little short summary of it, two verses. They still wouldn't believe it. They still wouldn't believe it. So you want to know one real proof that the Bible is true? God appeared to women. Jesus appeared to women first. And the apostles, the great ones, the ones that's going to change, and they are the great men. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to act like they're not great men. I'm just saying the Bible is so honest, it shows them in their sins. It shows them in their unbelief. They refuse to believe our witnesses. And people say, man, if I could see Jesus walk on the water, I'd become a Christian. If I could see a miracle this or a miracle that, I'd become a Christian. No. The Bible says faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God on everything we print we got that verse on there Romans chapter 10 verse 17 that's our theme faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God then arose Peter and ran now we know John was with him but Luke just tells us about Peter ran into the sepulcher in fact John says he actually runs into the sepulcher stooping down and beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves he departed at least he's wondering in himself at that which was come to pass his enemies remembered that Jesus said he was going to raise from the dead so they got Pilate to set a guard there I wonder sometimes if we purposely try not to believe the word of God Christian brother and sister you don't have to wonder about certain things God's word is very true and the part that it's not true on that's what we pray about I mean not, not explicit enough. should I move to Texas to take a job I can't help you with that I'll pray with you, but that's up to you, you know. But don't come and ask me if it's wrong for you to drink your family's money away. I'll tell you, take you to the verse and show you the verse in the Bible says that you're not to be a drunkard. Don't come, you know, there's, the Bible's pretty clear on how to live right, you know. Okay, so at this time we're going to uh, close out our broadcast, and then we'll take time for questions and comments. <laughs>